For the next 365 days, I am going to be filming what it takes to be a farmer, which is one of the hardest jobs in the world. My name is Cole the Corn Star, and I am a fifth generation farmer from Iowa with over 200 years of combined farming experience bred into my DNA. I run the operations on my family's 2,000 acre corn and soybean farm. So if farming is so difficult, what am I doing making this video? Shouldn't I just be off on the farm working, actually getting something done? The answer is, I feel people do not understand what it takes for food to get on to their table and I don't blame you. You walk into the store, you find what you need, you swipe your card, you come out to your vehicle, throw everything in and you leave. It's not like there's signs in the grocery store that show the blood, sweat, tears, and thousands of hours of effort that went into producing their produce. So if you're not exposed to it, how are you supposed to know? That is why I'm making this video. That is why I made this YouTube channel and that is why I have committed to making long form content about farming almost every other day for the last six years. Before we dive into this series, I would like to make a statement. This series, it's a one of a kind. It is one of one, the only one that exists. And it, who knows, maybe it will be the only one that ever exists. Farmers are super secretive and their farms are personal, rightfully so. Farmers don't share personal information. This is where the series being a one of one comes into play. I am going to be holding nothing back from how many hours we work to how much money we make. I am going to be covering it all. I want the world to understand what it's like to be a farmer. So I'm willing to pull back the curtain and expose farming for what it really is. With that being said, this is how the series is going to go. Farming consists of five seasons. Season one is planting. Season two is crop management. Season three is harvest. Season four is selling the harvest. And season five is preparation for next year. For the next 365 days, I am going to be video documenting every single farm interaction and decision that is made on my family's 2,000 acre corn and soybean operation. Every day, I will be adding up our expenses, our income, and how many hours we worked. At the end of the 365 days, we will have a full summary of the farm's expenses, income, profit, and hours worked. Due to the amount of privacy that I am not keeping, in order to protect my family's farm from competing farms, I do have a couple stipulations. Number one, I am not going to disclose how much of our crop inputs are financed with our own money. I will be assuming that 80% of our farming expenses will be financed through an operating line of credit at our local bank using an interest rate of 9%. Borrowing for 80% of our farming input expenses is not uncommon in the farming world, and that's typically going to be the threshold for a bank. Number two, when it comes to land, we own some of it and we rent some of it. However, I'm going to be treating it all as rented ground and we are going to be using an average rental price of $279 an acre, which is the average for the entire state of Iowa. Number three is we will be assuming a $20 per hour labor rate, which according to ZipRecruiter falls into the top 15% of farmhand earners, which my team is more than qualified to be in. And then number four, I will only be including farm related income. So income from selling corn, income from selling beans or anything that we are doing around the farm if we sell a piece of equipment or something like that, but it will not include any off farm income. But those are separate businesses. And then lastly, when it comes to tracking our daily income and expenses, I will be able to track our daily labor rates, but when it comes to everything else, I'm going to have to wait until the end of the month when our canceled checks come back from the bank, and then we will be able to add in all of our income, and we will be able to add in all of our expenses. There's gonna be five of us running around, and everybody's getting things all the time, so it would be impossible to keep track of on a daily basis, so that will just be all added up at the end of each month. And now that I got those stipulations out of the way, let me introduce myself, my family, and our farm, and then we will get into the realities of farming and some of the challenges we are already facing going into this next year. My name is Cole the Corn Star, and no, the Corn Star is not my real middle and last name, but Cole is my real first name. I am a Christian man. I am a husband to my beautiful wife, and I'm a dad to two joyful, little boys. I was born in 1997 and I was raised on my family's farm in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. Growing up as a child, my parents did not let me have any gaming consoles. We didn't have cable television and this was pre-kids having cell phones. So 
I was extremely curious and I spent a lot of time reading. It was not uncommon of me to read a hundred pages a day. I, I literally read all the time. I was in my school's talented and gifted program. I competed in and won a few scholastic events. I lost my 4.0 GPA in Spanish class after my teacher thought I used a translator on the test. I graduated second in my high school class and I went to university for $5,000 and I completed my four-year finance degree in three years. I held a United States bench press record when I was 17. I participated in speech contests in high school plays. By the time I turned 21, I saved $100,000 making $10 an hour. I hunt, I fish, I batted 380 in high school baseball. I play three instruments, I speak Spanish. I haven't had a pop in 12 years. And I really enjoy listening to Dave Ramsey. My parents are named Daddy Cornstar and Mama Cornstar. I have a younger brother named Cooper and an older sister named Summer. Dad and Cooper work on the farm with me. My mom has been a master hairstylist for almost 40 years and my sister runs her own business. So this brings us to the farm. I'm a fifth generation farmer, so that means that my great great grandfather farmed, my great grandfather farmed, my grandfather farmed, my dad still farms, and I farm. So that is five generations. And then if my boys come in, they will be the sixth generation. And on some of the ground that we farm to this day is some of the ground that my great, great grandfather would have farmed. So that's pretty cool. My great, great grandpa Ernest was the one who bought the original main farm property. He sold that property to my great grandpa Bill. Great grandpa Bill somehow managed to accumulate 800 acres during his farming career. And before he passed away, he sold his 800 acres to his five kids. So my grandpa Ray ended up buying the main farm property house and the 120 acres behind it just after he got out of the Coast Guard where he was a diesel mechanic. And then my dad would have came along shortly after and my dad always helped my grandpa when he was a little boy, five years old, driving the combine. When my dad was 12, he decided he was going to get his own pigs. And by the time my dad was 13, dad was making $30,000 a year off of his pigs. So my dad and my grandpa decided they were going to go into the hog business together. Four years later, when my dad was a 17 year old junior in high school, he ended up buying his first 80 acres for $1,450 an acre, smack in the middle of the 1980s farming crisis. So for the next 15 years, my dad and grandpa raised corn, soybeans, hay, and pigs. Then one year after I was born, the worst day in pig market history occurred and live feeder weights for pigs bottomed out at eight cents a pound. That is eight cents for a pound of pork. It was also around this time where our hog buildings were starting to get wore out and they needed to be replaced. So under severe financial strain, dad and grandpa decided that they were going to get out of the hog market and just focus on the crop side of farming. My dad and grandpa Ray were best friends. They were truly inseparable. They were always together. It was the most beautiful father-son relationship I've ever seen. My grandpa Ray unfortunately passed away shortly before I started my YouTube channel in 2018. So you guys have never met him and you won't get to unless if you go to heaven, you, you'll meet him there. But there's a few things you should know about him. Grandpa Ray, while he was not born during the Great Depression, he was a product of the Great Depression. So anything that he ever got, he never wanted to throw away. And you know the saying, you can fix anything with a pipe wrench and duct tape? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was written after my Grandpa Ray. If six inches of concrete was enough, Grandpa wanted 14. And I'm pretty sure the word tack weld did not exist in my Grandpa's vocabulary. He, he really liked his stick welding. My Grandpa willed his way into being a successful farmer when he needed a new disc. He took two 15 footers that he already had and he shackled them together to make them into a 30 foot disc. When he needed a new planter, he took an eight row and a 12 row that we already had sitting out back and he brought them into the garage, cut them up with the torch, added a few hydraulic cylinders and he built his own custom 16 row planter. And when he needed an enclosed trailer, 
we had a train not too far from us hit a semi-trailer, cut the semi-trailer right in half. So grandpa went to the place where they brought the wrecked semi-trailer and he bought the front half of it that was still good and he moved that and set that on an old straight truck frame and welded on a hitch. There was his trailer. Remember when I said I saved $100,000 making $10 an hour? Well, I got that trait from my grandpa. My grandpa's dream was for his son and grandsons, me and my brother, to carry on the farm. So he literally invested everything that he made into the farm. Here's where we ran into our only problem. My grandpa was investing all of the money that he was making, but he didn't make enough money to be able to buy things cash outright. So while he was putting all of his money into the farm, we were also borrowing a lot of money from the bank at the same time. Which in the long run was a really good decision, but in the short run, which was the entire time that I grew up, the farm was not able to cover all of its own bills, and what it couldn't cover was supported by our off-farm income. As a result, the farm accumulated over a $500,000 loss, and almost all of our day-to-day -day operation expenses were 100% financed by the bank. So yes, our net worth was increasing, but it was all on paper because all of our money was going straight to bank loans. And this is where I come into play. Remember those days when I was reading 100 pages a day when I was a little boy? That was right in the middle of the Great Recession in the United States. So when I would get home from school, I would watch an episode of King of the Hill, and then I would watch an episode of The Simpsons. Between episodes, the news anchors would get on, and they would talk about ways that we could save money, and they talked about the importance of it. So I literally grew up with that. So thanks to my local news anchors, they started my financial education journey. That turned me into a super saver. By the time I was 12, I had a few thousand dollars. And then when I got into high school, my algebra teacher, Mrs. Roberts, applied for a $5,500 Dave Ramsey grant. And my school was selected. So for an entire semester, Dave Ramsey and his team taught us the power, importance, impact, and step-by-step -step how to save, invest, and give. To this day, that is the best course on financial education that I have ever had. So when I graduated college with all my degrees that show I know everything, I came back to revolutionize my family's farm. Year number one, I made some accounting errors and I cost the farm an extra $10,000 in taxes. During year number two, long story short, I tried a bunch of new things and our crops looked the worst out of anything that I've ever seen in my life. Now, luckily for us, that year a derecho blew through the state and our crops were standing so thinly, the wind blew right through them and it did not blow them down onto the ground. And we had the best yields in the area. We got lucky there, but our, our crops looked ugly. Since the derecho in year two blew down our grain handling facility, we built a new one in year three and it got tied up in a lawsuit. Year number four, I tried a bunch of new methods to fertilize our crops and I lost $50,000. And then in year five, I overbooked $12,000 worth of seed and I accidentally sprayed $5,000 worth of extra product on a few fields. So over the last five years, due to farm decisions that I have personally made, I have lost over $100,000 and frankly, I'm glad that it happened. I'm glad these things happened to me, not because I like losing money, but because it shortened my learning curve. Dave Ramsey taught me to budget. So I had a try things budget. So while some of my mistakes were due to inexperience and lack of due diligence, some of them were calculated risks that just drew the short end of the stick. So while these things happened and we lost money out of it, what we learned was a hundred times more valuable. Year one, when I made the $10,000 accounting error, well, guess who now triple checks every single penny that passes through the farm? Year number two, when we had the ugly crop, do you know how embarrassing that was? Since then, I have spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours researching how to have an excellent crop. So that way, that will never happen again. Year number three, the grain bin site fiasco. This is still under litigation, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I will say this. I do know what I will do differently next time. Year number four is when I lost $50,000 trying the new fertilizing methods. 
This was just a, drew the short end of the stick. It was a calculated risk, but I did learn I need to be more patient and I need to learn how to double down on the fundamentals before I start trying to do complicated things. Year five is when I over-ordered and over-applied inputs. Because of this, records are now triple checked with multiple people. So with all these mistakes that I've made, how can I have the least bit of credibility? My grandpa sacrificed an easy life so he could give us the opportunity to have one. I watched my family work for over two decades, seven days a week, 12 hours a day, living grain check to grain check, going deeper and deeper into debt in hopes that our family's farming legacy could continue on. This amount of blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifice is something that I take personally. I am not a college research professor using donor money. I am not a company trying to push a product. I am not a politician trying to get votes. I am a 26-year-old farmer who is both financially and mentally committed to seeing the well-being of my family's heritage succeed. My only agenda is the truth. I just ask one thing from you. I think it's really important for the world to know where our food comes from and what it takes to produce it. So I ask that you please share this video with a friend. I am now going to lay out the projections that we have going forward into this next crop year. By crop year, I mean from the time that it takes us to plant our seed, raise our seed, harvest our seed, and then sell our harvest. Once our harvest is completely sold, that is a full crop year cycle. Since we don't know what kind of crop year we are going to have, we base all of our beginning of the year projections on historical averages. Corn Star Farms has a historical production yield of 196 bushels per acre for corn and 56 bushels per acre for soybeans. When that's compared to the Iowa 10-year average, which has corn at 195.1 bushels per acre and soybeans at 56.9 bushels per acre, Corn Star Farms raises slightly above average corn and slightly below average soybeans. And by the way, a bushel is a volumetric measurement. This is a bushel basket. And back in the day, when they filled it full of corn, it weighed 56 pounds. And when they filled it full of soybeans, it weighed 60 pounds. Therefore, one bushel of corn is 56 pounds of corn, and one bushel of soybeans is 60 pounds of soybeans. And an acre is an area measurement. If you took an NFL football field and went five yard line to five yard line, the entire width of the field, Field, that is an acre. With our total yields in hand, we can now calculate the farm's projected total gross income, which falls into four different categories. Crop income, government payments, co-op dividends, and crop insurance. For our crop income projection, historically, we can sell our corn to Cedar Rapids for the highest price and our soybeans to Des Moines for the highest price. So we are going to be using their October future cash prices, which is $4.46 for corn and $11.21 per bushel for soybeans. So if we achieve historical average yields and use these current future prices, we will have a total income of $874 per acre for corn and $628 per acre for soybeans. So if we take that across our thousand acres of corn and thousand acres of soybeans, we will have $874,000 from our corn and $600 and $28,000 from our soybeans. This would be a total gross crop income of $1,501,920. And remember, these are just projections. If we get better yields, we'll make more money. If we get worse yields, we'll make less money. If we get better prices, we'll make more money. If we get worse prices, we'll make less money. So this is where things get really tricky because is 446 and 1121 a good price? Looking at it now, we don't know. What if the price goes up to six bucks and $15? Then we're like, man, why did we lock in a contract at 446 and 1121? We left a bunch of money on the table. But on the flip side of that, what if the price goes down to $3 and 950? Then we're like, oh man, we should have pulled the trigger right away and sold everything for 446 and 1121. So this is why market is so difficult and honestly we are not good at it we hire ever ag to come in and help us try to make the best sales possible because they are 100 times better at marketing than we are just to help build a little context of what incremental price changes can do for every 25 cents the market goes up for corn 
we make an extra $49,000. And for every 50 cents that soybeans goes up, we make an extra $28,000. So this is why getting the top price for our grain and marketing is so important for the farm. And then when it comes to government payments, typically the United States government looks at farmer's income and says, okay, we need you to be here to prevent you from going bankrupt. So if some sort of catastrophic event happens, like a storm that wipes out two thirds of the state of Iowa, or there's a trade agreement that makes the price of corn and soybeans just dive to unsustainably low levels, the United States government will step in and say, okay, what do we need to do to help get farmers to here to keep them from going bankrupt? And so then a government payment would be issued. Looking into the projections going into this next year, we should not have a government payment. And with the information I'm going to present in a few moments, this may be questioned a little bit, but remember it is a year behind. So a government payment coming in this year would be based on last year's season, not the season that we are projecting going into now. Another form of income we get is co-op dividends. Over the years, we've bought shares into our local co-op. When they have a good year, they pay out. Some years we don't get anything. Some years we get a pretty good check. So for projection purposes, we are just going to call this $1,000 of co-op dividend income. And then for our last form of farm income, we have crop insurance. Now, just like government payments, crop insurance only kicks in when bad things happen. We are projecting an average year. So in an average year, crop insurance will not kick in. So we are doing a zero payout on crop insurance. And honestly, we want it that way because if we can get our grain in the bin and sell it, we will make more money doing it that way than getting a crop insurance check. So if we have an event later in the year, we'll cover crop insurance then. But for now, we are assuming zero crop insurance income. Now that we've came up with our total projected gross farm income of $1,502,000, we need to project what our expenses are going to be because this is going to tell us how much money do we actually need to make in order to cover all of our bills. We call this the break-even point. Our expenses are going to fall into 12 different categories. Now some of these are fixed so we know exactly what they're going to be and other ones are variable. So we are going to be estimating what it was based on historical averages in the past. These are the 12 categories, purchasing equipment, cash rent, chemical seed fertilizer, dues, fuel, insurance, labor, repairs, supplies, trucking, utilities, and operating interest. When it comes to buying equipment, we typically make this decision well in advance. So we know what we are going to be buying going into that year. This year, we are not projecting to buy anything. Our land rent is a fixed expense. We farm 2,000 acres and it costs $279 an acre to rent it. So we will pay $558,000 in cash rent. Seed, fertilizer, and chemicals, which are behind me or spread out in the fields, are a fixed cost at $709,000. The dues category, which might as well be called equipment payments, is going to come in at $120,000. Fuel is hard to estimate because we don't know what the price is going to be, but we're going to project $100,000. Trucking is based on how many bushels we raise, so if we raise historical averages, we will spend $83,000 on trucking. As much as we don't like paying the premiums, when we have any problems, we are glad glad that we have it. So for insurance, we are going to be paying $85 thousand dollars. Labor can be a little tricky because we have our farm activities and we have off farm activities. So sometimes some of us are working on the farm and others are doing off farm stuff. We are only going to be tracking man hours worked on farm activities. So we are going to assume 6,000 man hours, which will come in at $120,000. And then we have another layer of labor, which is our professional fees. So we have things like our attorney, our grain marketing team, Ron, the bulldozer guy, when he comes out and does work. That's going to come in at $40,000. Repairs and supplies have been absolutely eating us alive for the last couple of years, so I'd really like to get this number down to $100,000 this year. It's going to be a challenge, but we're going to see if we can do it. The farm's utility bill for things like electricity, water, our mobile plans comes in at $15,000. And then last but not least, we have, well, it could be least because it's my personal least favorite. We have operating interest, which is a silent thief of profits. Adding up together all of our other projected expenses, we are at $1.9 million. Earlier in the video, when I talked about stipulations, I said that we would be borrowing 80% of our expenses from the bank at a 9% interest rate. $1.9 million at an 80% borrow rate 
is 1.5 million. So we will be borrowing $1.5 million from the bank at a 9% interest rate. Now, here's the thing. We're not going to be borrowing all 1.5 million day one upfront, paying 9% of $1.5 million for the entire year. The first month, we may take out $100,000. Next month, maybe another $100,000. Third month, maybe $400,000. So each month that goes by, that number that we are borrowing just keeps going up and up and up until the end of the year where we are at our $1.5 million. So the calculation is not as simple as just 1.5 million times 9%, which is $139,000. So I'm going to use a 70% multiplier. So basically saying 70% of the year, we're basically going to be borrowing that money. So $139,000 times 70% is $97,000. So I project we are going to spend $97,000 in operating interest. Adding all 12 categories together, our total expenses is projected to be $2,027,000. Compared to our projected income of $1,502,920, that brings us up, <laughs> oh man, I can't believe this is what things are projecting to be. <laughs> that brings us to a projected loss of $523,080. I triple checked all of my numbers. I, I don't believe this either, but $523,000 projected loss going into the season. That is as bad as I have ever seen it. There is two reasons why this massive deficit is being projected. It is the price of corn and soybeans and the expenses going into raising them. So the price of corn and soybeans last year, corn was $6. Now it is $4.46. Soybeans last year were $13. Now they are $11.21. But I don't really think the price is necessarily our problem because over the last 10 years, a 446 and an 1121 is not a bad price to be at. Between 2014 and 2020, the average price of corn was $3.59 a bushel, and the average price of soybeans was $9.54 a bushel. So 446 and 1121 are well above that, so I don't necessarily think that that is fully to blame because those are relatively good prices. The problem arises on the expenses end of things. Here's the way farming works. Commodity prices and expenses pretty much go hand in hand. So when commodity prices are low, expenses stay down with them. But when commodity prices start to go up, expenses go up with it. So what we had happen, 2014 to 2020, everything expense-wise pretty much stayed flat because the price of grain was pretty much flat. But once we hit 2021, the price of corn went from 350 to six bucks and beans went from 10 to 14. And all of a sudden, all of the expenses just shot up. Fertilizer more than tripled, chemicals tripled, interest rates doubled, parts doubled, diesel fuel doubled, seed went up 10%, and rent went from $219 an acre to $279 an acre. So our total cost of production almost doubled going from 2020 into 2022. As much as we didn't like the expenses going up and up and up, the price of grain was staying up there with it. So we could afford to pay our bills. It, it wasn't fun, but we had the revenue there from the crops that we generated to be able to pay those triple, double, up whatever percentage expenses. Now what we're running into now is chemicals, they basically halved once they tripled. Fertilizer halved once it tripled, but almost everything else has stayed exactly where it was. So we have super elevated expenses relative to what the price of grain is right now. So that is what is causing us to have this massive projected deficit. And the thing that kind of stinks is there is not a whole lot we can do. Whatever the market is going to do is what the market is going to do. The only thing we can control is when we make the sale. So we try to time things for when things are at a high price. So Ever Ag is going to help us take care of that. We can control our expenses. So 
don't buy anything that we don't need. We will try our hardest to raise as much yield as we possibly can, but there's only so many variables that we can control when it comes to that. And then on these past couple good years that we've had, if we have some extra money sitting over, we basically have to be willing to cough that up and say, okay, well, we're showing a loss and we made some profits, so we may have to rob Peter to pay Paul to keep us going. And those are really our only options. I'll be honest, these numbers are not fun to look at because I know how much effort is going to go into raising this crop and when you're taking all this time, effort, lack of sleep, frustration, and just overall work, and you're projecting a $500,000 loss. Like you are, you're not even doing it for free. You're, you're paying to do this work. I don't like looking at it, but these are just projections. So we do need to keep that in mind. Prices can always go up. Yields can always be better. But at the same time, yields can always be worse and prices can always go down. So this is what we are facing for an economic projection going into this next farming year. I understand that everything I just talked about is like drinking through a fire hose. There is a lot of information. My job by the end of this series is to make all of this information fun, digestible, and easy to understand. So for the next 365 days, I am going to be video documenting every single day we are working on the farm and we will see how close to our projected gross income are we going to get and how close to our projected expenses are we going to get so we can find out what is it like to be a farmer. Welcome to the farm.